I'm your host, Dean. Welcome to Way of Life. Today I have with me Victoria, and we're going to be speaking about Chinese geomancy, commonly known as Feng Shui. Could you start with giving us a simple overview of Feng Shui? Yes. So, Dean, I'm going to give your listeners a simple overview of Feng Shui, Feng Shui basics. So really, the chief principle of Feng Shui is really to observe the landscape and to redirect the natural resources of Mother Nature to benefit the people in any building. So Feng Shui. So in Chinese, the word feng translates to wind and shui means water, which really gives us a clue in that at the core of this science is this understanding about how the cosmos and the land formations intertwine and how it influences people's lives. And then complementing this are the technical strategies employed to draw in the goodness from Mother Nature, but arranging the architecture the design and the furnishings of a building within, really to synchronise it with its surroundings and really to support the people inside those buildings. So just moving on from that, this kind of Eastern discipline actually dates back to 6,000 years ago. And it really does apply to millions of us today in this millennial world. This in itself is a testament to its authenticity. Whilst Feng Shui initially flourished amongst the elites of China, its techniques and application became actually widespread across the wealthy of other Eastern, or I would say East Asian countries especially. And to date, countries such as Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand, Korea, and even Japan, they have actually embedded many of the feng shui principles for city planning, uh, really with the objective in mind to create prosperity for their people. And so to a trained practitioner, it is easier to spot these buildings in the UK and Europe, which have been configured and kind of aligned with the feng shui discipline. So actually in the West, feng shui made headlines, let's say almost 25 years ago, actually, and became rather a fashionable term branded around uh, by the socialites, if I uh, may say. Many companies, um, for example, such as British Airways, Air France, The Body Shop, the HSBC Bank, uh, Carlsberg, but to name a few, actually rushed to hire a lot of feng shui practitioners from Eastern countries to improve their brands and their businesses. In truth, feng shui has always been a luxury have. In China, it was a service provided to those only with connections to royal palaces and estates. The reality was and is today that if cost was of no object, then you employed a feng shui master to implement sophisticated techniques to provide you with an advantage over your competitors. Now, the key question is, are you ready to put yourself equally at an advantage and thrive in different aspects of your life? So that is just simple overview of feng shui basic. Well, that's a history that I've never heard before. And it's amazing to think around 25 years ago was when it only became popular in the West, so to speak, considering you gave it a date of 6,000 years old, which is pretty much the dawn of known civilization or recorded civilization. Yes, Quite indeed. incredible. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a wonderful modality dating so far back in time, used and applied across so many different countries, not only Southeast Asian, Eastern countries, but very much in the West now, across so many different continents. Well, the next question I think is going to be, especially from some of the things that you were hinting at in your introduction, probably one of the most enlightening parts, I hope, of this interview, and that's the spelling myths about it. So I just wondered what Feng Shui is and what it's not, and it, its true scope and form, if we could look into that as well. Absolutely. And I, I actually love um, debunking these Feng Shui myths. Um, it is a passion of mine. Um, look, now millions of people across the globe have heard of Feng Shui through vast publications and websites which promote you know, it's different schools with its quirky sounding terminologies and, you know, all linked to different kind of Chinese modalities ranging from space clearing to spiritualism, superstition, magic and religion. So unwittingly, the hype to commercialise this art has created more confusion um, rather than providing clarity to a, the average person who simply wants to apply the applications and, you know, yield results. So, you know, clients and students often start with 
the same question in mind. And many ask, for example, which school of feng shui actually works? What if I don't want to remove a wall or change my door? And what if my space is limited and I can't move my furniture? Is feng shui like some magic pill that works? Am I going to have a windfall and become the next billionaire? Well, let's just keep it short and sweet um, in terms of an answer. And let me ask, um, let me answer the last question in terms of magic first. It gives me the opportunity to say that Feng Shui has absolutely nothing to do with superstition, religion, space clearing and magic. In fact, you don't even need to believe in Feng Shui and its principles for it to work. And a lot of people hear about these little trinkets, amulets, statues and traditional Chinese ornaments, these colourful ornaments, hanging wind chimes. You know, in reality, in classical feng shui, none of these things are linked. Classical feng shui, classical authentic feng shui has got nothing to do with little trinkets. It is about using the energy of mother nature, the land itself, from external into internal. So the, where, where I say a lot of these objects have been commercialized it's just for mass production and to make money that's what it, that's what it's about but if you look at where the origins of feng shui come from they come from how people built their homes and houses and they they then in turn became villages which supported people by the rivers and the lakes and where they had the mountains and it's all about farming and farmland and none of those people 6,000 years ago had little trinkets and amulets and hung wind chimes and um, dragons and all sorts so I hope that answers the question for the listeners out there who are buying certain certain objects which they feel that are linked to feng shui now when you buy an ornament or an object it might make you feel good and that's perfect that's great have it in your home if you want to hang a painting up in your home that looks good and it's beautiful and it makes you feel good that is not necessarily feng shui but perhaps the very fact that you might hang a painting on the wall and nailing it nailing the wall in order to hang that piece of painting if you're nailing the wall you are creating a vibration and if it's in the right place at the right time, then that's what you're activating. You might be activating good energy and that support the energy of feng shui. With this dispelling of the myths, now we've narrowed it down to energies and I suppose placement on the earth in referring to being near mountains, which be rich in minerals and ore, being near riverways, of course, which is vital for civilization. So that positional aspect. And you, is there a way of breaking down like the base energies that, that feng shui encapsulates at all? Is there like a list of elements? Yes, there are a list of elements. So the principle of feng shui comes from the theory of yin and yang. Feng shui is founded of the, on the principle of yin and yang and the theory of the five elements. These are the very principles used in acupuncture, qigong, traditional Chinese medicine, tai chi. All of these are used in tapping to, to the natural energies to heal the mind and the body. And so what feng shui does is that we cultivate the external energy to come into our homes and offices to support the people. And so we know that yin, ya, yin and yang, well I say yin yang because in the classical Chinese text there is no such term as yin and yang. It's called yin yang because yin yang means part of one whole so for example we know that yin represents quieter dark very kind cold descending receiving energies and the yang is more about the light joyfulness and representing the summer the heat and it's an ascending creative energy so when we say yin and yang in a home we're not talking about one place should be darker and one place should be lighter, one place should be more quiet and one place should be louder. No, the principle is about what places should be yang and what places should be yin. So there is this misconception. So for example, bedrooms should be yin for peaceful and rejuvenative sleep for healing and recovery, let's say from surgery. And living room spaces and offices should be more yang for active productivity in order to have that wealth opportunity being activated and generated. Now, linked, as I said earlier, to the theory of yin and yang is the theory of the five elements. 
Now, the five elements is a systematic study as a mechanism to balance this yin and yang. This is actually where the Taoist philosophy believe in that the five elements govern the life force in the universe and that it's the secret of life. So some people call it the Taoist theory, some people call it the Taoist theory. It just depends. So what we're saying about this secret of life, which is the five elements, is that the interactions between these five elements helps us to understand the energy patterns in the universe and that very time and place we know what are these patterns. So this brilliant formula allows us to forecast the influences of the surroundings on different aspects of people's lives at any given time. So this theory of the five elements allows us to forecast what can happen in your life in a year's time, in five years time, in 20 years time. Isn't that interesting that you can forecast what could happen and you can mitigate certain circumstances or you can use the opportunity of certain circumstances. Fascinating, don't you think, Dean? I do, and um, you probably don't realise this because uh, I haven't really mentioned much about what I've spoken about on the show. And way of life actually is heavily influenced by Taoist philosophy. So listeners will be quite aware of some of the parts you're talking about, especially when in relation to yin, yang, how they are actually uh, one entity flowing and also existing because the other exists dancing together essentially and you see if you see the symbol itself you'll have a white dot in the overall black and a black dot in the overall white and they'll be moving around in rhythm as one. Oh, I'm very excited to know that the listeners already have a good foundation of this what we're talking about here. I think it's all very much interlinked and as you know feng shui is one of the five arts from, which includes physiology, acupuncture or very much linked to the theory of yin and yang yes. So my understanding is that certain classical Chinese national treasures would include typically feng shui as one of the arts they would know along with maybe music, martial arts, certain healing, acupuncture, therapy, yes. physiotherapy. Yes, absolutely. It is, a, is it, a, it is one of those gems of, of the five arts and um, all of them have this theory in common, the theory of yin and yang and the theory of the five elements. They underpin all of these five arts. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I haven't quite worked out the difference between the five element um, and the eight elements, but suffice it to say, I think Eva would do. And I think in Feng Shui, <laughs> obviously going back to five, yeah. um, perhaps because it's so old, I don't know, because I know there's five in the ancient Hindu uh, concept, although I'm not sure if the fifth in Hindu, which is a Kasha, exists in the Chinese approach. But nonetheless in other words empty space yes um, and i find you're absolutely right these concepts around energy they're not a new phenomenon as you know you know they date back and they're across so many different cultures there is such a closeness between feng shui and vatsu something very similar in practice in the indian culture that's their form of energy feng shui i call it and again, in Persian history, something very similar where they, they have the five elements, but instead of water, they, they call it air. So that's, um, that's the only difference, really. Um, so across cultures, the theory of balancing energy and activating energy and knowing how to redirect it, or I would say engineer it, it plays a huge significance across so many different cultures. So it has so much value. So what we don't see with the naked eye has always been valued across so many cultures. It's just that in this modern day, we kind of lose sight of so many things that exist around us because we are so caught up with what we see and what we hear and what we feel from what we see does that make sense i think so and one thing i just want to throw in there and this is only a side note i'm so glad that you brought up persia because it is known that if you trace martial arts which essentially is the control of the human body and understanding of the energies of the human body it actually starts in ancient persia then moves on to india which it actually spreads over to China and then on to Japan, etc., Korea. Yes. So that is that is a known path. <laughs> Fascinating. There, there is um, there's I, I like learning new things every day, and 
certainly that's one fascinating fact. <laughs> yeah, I just found that interesting, just talking about different disciplines. I mean, obviously, it's not feng shui, but it just so happens that you're, you're mentioning the elements and I'm mentioning the martial arts section, which, of course, yeah. is still part of that wheelhouse, shall we say. Yeah. So I'm kind of going to ask you a simple question that might come in later. But you mentioned about how in, say, a house, you talked about like vibration potentially from nature. I know it's just an example, but like nailing a, a pin or, or something into the wall for a painting. And you mentioned about not trinkets and so on. Are there typical objects? rather than the building itself so furnishings that go into the building that are thought about in feng shui if you're thinking about a modern building uh, so is the question about are there any feng shui objects that that are used in feng shui is that yeah, the question or, yeah or objects you worry about in feng shui is in what goes inside worry. the building rather than well, not worry but think about ra- rather than just the placement of the actual building itself but placement of objects in the building whether it's a mirror a table, anything like that. Okay, so yes, uh, so we're talking about placement and positioning inside the home. And yes, I was going to talk a little bit about that later on, but we'll, we can delve into it a little bit now. So look, let's go back to this. There are four major aspects of feng shui, okay? There's the time which we look at, which has an influence on the environment. And certain locations can be prosperous at a time and certain locations may not be prosperous at other times. So really it's important for you to know the time when a location is prosperous because there's a formula for you to apply in order to know when exactly your property can be good for you or your family members. So that's number one, the concept of time. Then we have the other factor, number two which is about the environment. So about 70% of feng shui involves our external environment. So this is all, as I alluded to earlier, is about mother nature. So it's about the contours of the land. It's about the rivers. It's about the streams. It's about the sea, the ocean, the mountains, the hills. And many people will say, but actually in the city, there are no hills. Vicky, where are we going to find hills which support the feng shui of our home? Well, actually, to a trained practitioner, there are hills. There are certain hills in the city and certain landforms are higher and certain landforms are lower. And buildings themselves within city planning can reflect a mountain, which is very important. So the third aspect of feng shui is the different types of building containing the energies from the environment. When I say different types of building, I'm talking about, is it a landed property? Is it a high rise, a skyscraper? Is it, for example, apartments or flats? Is it a converted home? So these are the different aspects. What type of building is it? Is it residential? Is it commercial? Is it a small shop? Because in feng shui, all of these different types of buildings will need a different support energy for the people within. Because when you live in a home, you want peace, quietness, happiness, joy, health. You don't necessarily have the same kind of energy that you would have in a commercial building or a factory, which is very, very yang, constantly flowing with people. That's not necessarily helpful for health. Okay, so then we go on to the fourth aspect. The fourth major aspect in feng shui is the people, the residents. At the end of the day, feng shui is for the people. The house is made for the people. We don't do feng shui for the house. We do feng shui to support the people. So we question, is the environment good for you? Does it fit you? Sometimes an environment or the house may be good for someone, for example, your mother or your daughter, but it may not be good for you. I mean, you can find this out by looking at your own natal energy chart. And we will go into that because when we do the feng shui analysis for a home or a business or whatever building it may be, we're looking at the energy blueprint of that building. But what we also take into consideration, as I said, is your own personal energy map. We all have our own DNA. We all have our own fingerprints. If our DNA and fingerprints are similar to somebody else's or are the same or the exact same as somebody else's, we may have a problem because we are unique. Therefore, our uniqueness will carry its own blueprint. So what we do is match the DNA of the people against 
that particular building. So in answering your question, what are the kind of things that a feng shui practitioner will consider for a building? Well, we need to consider, are we activating, are we enhancing the good energies or are we mitigating, therefore curing unwanted, undesired energies? So when we talk about objects in a home, what we want to avoid are sharp objects, pointing objects in a home. For example, when you go through the door, we want to make sure that there are no obstacles in front of the door. There is no cluster in front of the main door because your main door is what we call the chi mouth. And when I talk about chi, I'm talking about energy, the vibration. So we, our front door is very, very important. It acts as the mouth for the energy to come in at the starting point through the home. So we don't want any blockages. It's just like your mouth when you're eating. If you have a spoon in your mouth, you can't breathe because even through the nose, it becomes difficult. Okay, so there is a blockage. There's a feeling of a blockage. So one of the things you talked about or you mentioned earlier on was a mirror. When you open your front door, you don't want to be met with a front mirror. So ideally, you don't want a mirror facing your door. But apart from that, I don't really think in classical feng shui there are any concerns about trinkets. You can use whatever you want. You may enjoy any of the objects. We just don't want clutter. When I talk about clutter, there's a misconception about clutter. Clutter doesn't mean that things that you do not use. Because things that you do not use maybe just be beautiful and ornamental and you may just want to look at it and love it and cherish it. When I talk about clutter, it could be things such as heavy furniture in a small place. In feng shui, everything has to have a proportionate size. So having huge furniture in a small space is considered clutter in feng shui. Do you see the difference? I do. Good. As you say, it's all about scale. Absolutely. Cl clutter could literally be a garage where you can barely fit the car in. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So there seems to be pages and pace, pages and courses on decluttering. Really, clutter is such a simple subject. Things that you do not use and things which are too big or oversized in a small space is considered clutter yeah i think that covers it fully there that's really good so i'm gonna take a little sidestep away from directly talking about the technical aspects of feng shui mm -hmm. for now because we're going to take quite a deep dive into it in the upcoming hour and a half or so and i just want to ask you what got you into feng shui and also your experience of certification in it okay so for me personally it wasn't one single event that triggered my interest in feng shui so as a seven-year-old child of dual heritage, I was always fascinated by different cultures. My grandfather was a traditional Chinese medical doctor, which is an art um, influencing my mother's interest in feng shui, actually. And for years, you know, I observed how she placed and repositioned certain items around the home. And I remember she had this quirky compass I used to follow her around with. Quite frankly, at the time, I used to think that the Chinese ornaments and these colourful trinkets were simply at odds with my parents' Middle Eastern designed home. And, you know, it, quite frankly, it, it, in my formal education, when I started going to London, going to college and university, I began to apply an evidence-based approach to my work and in my personal life and soon sort of put aside uh, what I misunderstood to be feng shui, to be some form of near superstition with a positive placebo effect on people. Of course, um, my mother continued to do her thing, her feng shui thing in any of the new houses I, you know, I purchased. I just let her carry on. I still had an eager interest, but it was at a short distance. Years later, I had uh, the time and opportunity to research different modalities on wealth and health, but I often found myself peering through the feng shui sections of the Watkins bookstore up in London near Leicester Square. Um, you know, I decided to pick up a hefty classical feng shui book 
packed with all these uh, formulas, rivers, mountains, numbers, all these different strategies. Um, most of them I found so intriguing. But I think one of the most intriguing part of my feng shui journey was when I plucked up the courage to finally ask my mum about some of these theories behind these practical things she was doing in our in our homes. And in essence, what she described to me correlated with many of the classical texts which I had read. And soon after, I decided to use one of my feng shui techniques in my old, my well, my previous home, because I was desperate to sell it. And so I was just absolutely astonished. And even the estate agent was astonished at the time when my house sold far higher than the marketed price. I mean, we knew that the value of the of the property perhaps was not quite as much as people were bidding for. And so this is where I began to understand the why behind the theories, the why behind the practices and applications. So the logic behind the application, as it were. In 2006, I traveled to China, the birthplace of feng shui, to learn a little bit more about the classical books, which were, are more readily available in China. I traveled to Hong Kong, Japan, Singapore, and also to France even, to undertake formal studies with feng shui grandmasters, renowned masters, and have been awarded the international and UK feng shui, feng shui accreditation. So I practice both here in the UK and internationally. One of the grandmasters that I have trained with is Grandmaster Raymond Lowe, who is based in Hong Kong, and the other is Dr. Stephen Skinner, who is Australian and based in Singapore. And one of my favorite teachers, if I may say, is Master or Grandmaster even, Tan Kun Yong, who is based in Singapore. And he makes everything seem so simple. He has this knack not to overcomplicate things. So Chinese metaphysics is just a very rich subject. And many of my, peer, many of my peers in this industry will agree with me when I say, if you want to grow, there is an infinite journey of learning in feng shui. So that is my journey. Thanks for that. And I think now it's time to really go heavy into this. So this is the bit that, that everyone's going to be is <laughs> wide open for. We'll start with a bit of a guide for the listeners. So uh, let's go for a root guide, um, an intro, a, a 101 to applied feng shui for people listening along and see how it can benefit them. And then after that, we'll do an example that I've given you some information that I couldn't put on air, of course. And <laughs> okay. we'll go through some targeted feng shui against myself and they can see what it's like when it's applied to someone. And then if we've got time at the end, we can hit into some of the most advanced, after I'm contradicting your grandmaster, some of the more advanced, subtler feng shui mm -hmm. and get some closing thoughts on it just to finish up so yeah let's go let's go for the introduction um, and benefits of feng shui for the listeners right so the first thing we need to be aware of um i know it's a basic 101 feng shui for everyone for your listeners we need to be aware that in feng shui there are two main schools okay one is classical authentic feng shui which is uh, originates uh, from the compass school so this is about using a special compass called the Lopan or Laopan, depending on where you are in the world that you pronounce it. And it's about calculating the configuration of the energies in your home. The other school is called the Form School. This is the oldest feng shui system, and it is what you see with the naked eye. So it examines the contours of the lands, the roads and the rivers, buildings and dams, including their shape and size and material and substance and even colours. So it's usually what we take for granted because we know it exists, because we can see it and we can touch it and yet often pay little attention to its intricacies. 
So I want you to think about the four seasons, how we have become accustomed to seeing the transition flow from spring, summer, autumn and into winter. So we don't often question the intelligent life force energy behind the transition, but we acknowledge it exists because it is visible and we see the autumn crisp leaves, the winter snowflakes, the, still, the summer heat wave, and we see the spring flowers bloom. And these are all tangible. Okay, so have this image in your mind. So for Feng Shui 101, this is what I want you to do. Instead of a low pan compass, which is a sophisticated tool, you can just pull out your normal phone, which should have a compass app. So your compass will basically behave like the sophisticated feng shui compass in terms of taking the correct degrees. So all you need to do is go and stand in the center of your home right now, if you want, while you're listening. And you take out your compass and basically you look for where the door is in your home and stand as though you are facing towards the door as though you're leaving your home. So you stand in the center of your home and looking out towards the door, your front door, as though you're leaving your home. On your compass, you look for the zero degrees facing north and you take down the degree showing on your phone compass. This gives you an indication of the facing of your home. Okay, so at this stage, you might say, wow, this is too technical. What do you mean facing? What I'm saying is we're looking at the energy that is coming through your main door. That's what we're doing. And the degree on your phone will tell us the energy coming through your home. Okay, so once you've done that, what I want you to do is fish out a floor plan. Now, you should all have a floor plan when you bought your home, when you purchased your home, or when you've rented, you can Google it, you, on right move, you can ask your estate agent. You look at your floor plan and I want you to center it off. What I mean by centering it off means that I want you to draw a square on your floor plan and draw a rectangular line on both sides as though you're squaring off your floor plan. So you should have an X in the middle of your floor plan. That is your center. Okay. Then using your compass, because you've got the degree, I want you to mark eight sections of your home. Okay. And that will be the cardinal directions and sub-cardinal directions. So you mark where it said zero degree on your floor plan and you work all the way around it. You make a pie chart. So you use a pencil and a ruler and you start drawing eight sections, like a pie chart, all across your floor plan. And you're marking the directions all the way from north, northeast, east, southeast, south, southwest, west, northwest, and then, of course, you're back at north. Now, each of those directions, cardinal and subcardinal, will have specific degrees, which are shown on your phone app. You don't have to put all of these in, but at the very least, all I want you to do is mark those directions. So that is coming through Feng Shui 101. Now, the next thing I want you to do, once you've plotted the directions, is I want you to bear these numbers in mind. I'm going to read them out to you. These numbers are qualities of energies for the year, the year 2021, which in the Chinese calendar is called the Metal Ox Year 2021. Now in this year, we have certain energies which will be spread across your home. Now, let me re read the energies which are gonna be spread across your home this year. Now let's start with the North. In the North, I want you to write number two. This is called number two, the Black Star. Each star is just given different colors. So that's all you need to remember. Number two in the north. Then you go across to northeast and write number nine. Nine purple. So its color is purple. Then I want you to go into the east and write number four. 
number four, the green star. Then to the southeast, number five, the yellow star. Then go into the south section and write one, the white star. Then to the southwest, number three, known as the jade star, also green. Then to the west, write number eight, the white star. And finally, in V, northwest, I want you to write number seven. OK, so we now have a chart on your floor plan. We have a floor plan with eight sections drawn onto it with the cardinal and sub-cardinal directions and the correct numbers which represent quality of energies for the year in the right directions. Okay, so before I go ahead, Dean, does that sound clear to you? I think that's clear for everyone. That was nice and paced slowly so people can go and listen to that back on the archive in a couple of days time if they miss some of it anyway. That's great. Perfect. So now we go into, let me describe what each of these energies actually mean and what they can do for you this year. So let's start with the North Star. The North Star, which I call the Black Star, is related to Mother Earth. It's related to the energy of health and well-being. So in the North sector of your home this year, what we want to do is make sure that your health and well-being is being prioritized because number two is related to that. So now how do we remedy any health issues or any potential health issues? What we do is in feng shui we have remedies and cures. For number two star which is the quality around health and well-being we generally place a salt cure for example so that is s-a-l-t salt cure. What we do is we use coarse salt it has to be coarse salt and you have for example a vase any kind of vase where you fill up half with water and half with the coarse salt and you can leave it in the north sector of your home to cure any potential health issues okay so now let's move to the northeast now in the northeast sector of the home this year we have the purple star which is known as the investment star. It's one of my favorite stars because it's all about joy and happiness and it's all about family and resting and having fun with your family. It's a star where if you want to make investments and if you want to have more opportunities for investments, for example, we have clients asking about trade or buying property, these kind of things, for example, we generally advise people to sit in the northeast sector of the home for this year. So make all your business calls and make all of your Zoom meetings, hosting your business meetings from the northeast sector of your home. Okay, moving on to the east sector of the home where we have the four, the number four star, known as the green star, known as the academic star. This is the sector of your home so where you can pick up a new skill, you can advance in what you're already learning or what you already know. For example, many parents want their students, or should I say want their children to be better students and have better skills when they are studying. So what we do is generally advise the parents to place their children in the east sector of the home this year for studying and academic achievements and passing exams. Right, now moving on to the southeast sector of the home where we have the five yellow star. And I know I never mentioned its color last time, but it's called the five yellow star. This is a star about, I would say, obstacles and challenges. So this is a star where it can cause some issues which makes our lives not go as smoothly as we want. So to cure this energy and neutralize it, what we do is we can hang a metal wind chime. Bear in mind, we want the wind chime to sound beautiful and sound um, having the pure sound of metal. So we don't want any wood elements in this wind chime. 
You can also play the sound of a piano in this area to cure any of these obstacles. Now, we will now move to the south sector of your home. Here we have the number one white star. It's known as the noble people star. This is where you can do your work, do your business, you can sit and meditate if you wish. And actually, this is a star about people helping you out. Good, genuine people coming to your aid. So for example, let's say you have a project and you don't know how to present using PowerPoint. Something as simple as that. Using this sector of your home means that people always freely and readily are accessible to you. Maybe, for example, your car breaks down and you're in the middle of the road in the pandemic and nobody can really come out. But using this sector of your home means for some reason there is a situation created where somebody comes to your aid. So that's why I love this sector of the home. Helpful people. The southwest sector of your home. This is the number three, Jade Star. This is known as the miscommunication star or the argumentative star. This is a star where there is a little bit of conflict. So when you tend to activate this sector of your home, there's sometimes family arguments and dramas, drama, 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 I call it. But of course, if you're someone that's quite quiet and generally you can't voice your opinions, it's a good sector to use because it gives you that confidence to speak out. So I like this sector. I like the star number three because it can be used in many ways. To mitigate the arguments, I always say you can use three long bamboo stems and place them inside the vase with water. And that's how you remedy any arguments. Now moving on to the west sector of your home. The west sector of the home has the eight white star this year, which is all about the abundance. This sector is used for working to generate wealth. This is the number eight star, which we call a timely star because we are in period eight. Now it sounds a little bit technical, I won't go into it, but it's a good star in general. Now, if you are an entrepreneur, this star is not for you. You use the nine star in the Northeast. But if you're working in an industry or a structured management, let's say, the military or you own um, a shop, for example, use the West sector because the energy of this sector helps you to boost your energy to work hard. So you're working hard and you're generating money. Now in the Northeast sector, finally, we have the star seven. This is a star which is about litigation, which means you have to be a little bit cautious about not getting in trouble with the law, not making mistakes through contracts. So this star we want to mitigate because it's almost like when you spend time in this sector of the home, you tend to have misinformation and make decisions based on misinformation. So how do we mitigate it? Quite easily. All we do is place something small, a red object, any red object in the sector of the home to mitigate some of the unwanted or undesired energies of star number seven. Now you may ask, what about at the center of my home? There's a number missing. When in the center of the home this year is star number six. And yes, you can use it. Star number six is about power and influence. Now again, if you are in a structured company or organization industry in a managerial position and you want to progress in your career, you can use this center space and spend time in there. Again, working, making your phone calls, you know, holding your Zoom meetings. Now you may ask, Vicky, why are you telling us to use these sectors, making phone calls and holding conversations and networking? Because the element in feng shui that is important is the human chi, the human energy. This is not magic. This is about the human utilizing the energy in that particular sector in that year to be able to 
support the activities and the goals you want for that year. So I hope this 101 introduction is useful and you can apply it straight away and achieve the goals you want for this year 2021. That's great. So there you have it. You've just had the overlay of the compass in traditional Feng Shui attuned to the very year we're in, 2021. So what more can we ask for? Thanks for that. Most welcome. And now we're going to start getting into a bit of a demo. So you might be thinking, OK, that was a bit impersonal. It was just for the year. So Vicky's kindly managed to ask me a couple of questions up front, which were my date of birth, time when I was born, the year that my house was built. And also she asked me, very similar to the 101 demo she gave to you all, if I stand in the middle of the house, what degrees and compass orientation am I at when I'm facing the front door, where it's positioned relative to where I'm standing in the middle of the house. And so now, hopefully, this will inspire people, give people uh, the idea of how some of this actually fits into practice when it's used against people in, in these places. Because as you were saying in your introduction, it's all about the people. Absolutely. OK, uh, so we're going to do this uh, live demo Dean has kindly provided me his date of birth, which I won't read out, obviously, for obvious reasons. And as I said earlier on, what I do is something quite specific. And most classical authentic feng shui practitioners will take into account your own personal energy natal chart and overlay it with the energy chart of a home to see whether the house supports you or not. And if it doesn't, to make adjustments. That's essentially what feng shui is about. Now, looking at Dean's date of birth, I see that he is a grey water day master. You're going to say to me, what on earth is grey water? It means he is a yin water, that means a quiet water person. That's who he is. He's a quiet water person. Now, in astrology, because this is actually about bazi, it means eight characters. This is Chinese astrology because the Chinese astrology provides me or a feng shui practitioner with the natal energy chart of a person. Now most commercialized astrology talks about one animal sign like for example a cancer or a rabbit or a horse or a Jupiter or Saturn and then you have the 12 zodiac sign goat, sheep, pig, rabbit, snake, all that. Well Actually, in Buzzy Chinese astrology, where we read a person's natal chart, each person has four animal signs because it includes the hour of birth, the day of birth, your month of birth and your year of birth. So actually, we all have four animal signs. The one we take into consideration the most is who you are as a person, which is the day you were born. And actually, you were born on a snake day. However, your yearly astrology sign or animal, zodiac animal, is the tiger. So you were a tiger, as well as a horse and a snake, Dean. Is this the first time you've heard of this? That is the first time I've heard of the multiple animals. When I have looked into Chinese astrology as a English-speaking only novice, I only knew about the one animal, the element associated with it, and the state of the animal. I did not know about the other animals that make up the entire date of birth. Okay, it's interesting. So this is uh, hopefully an interesting, intriguing fact for everybody here. We have four zodiac animal signs. Now, what I'm going to do is I am going to, first of all, look at your own natal energy chart and tell you a little about, if you don't mind, a little about your own energy levels. So what it says here um, from my uh, handwritten notes, what I've worked out is that actually you have a, quite a lot of fire in you. And fire is very important for joy and happiness. OK, it's an element, especially in the year 2023, 2024, when we shift into a different period. This is where your opportunities really begin here. You will come out of your shell and shine, as it were. And then one of the 
other elements you have in your chart is the wood element. And this is about your creativity. So you do enjoy things which um, allows you to have an output and be creative. So the fire element is supported by the wood because what does wood do to fire? It supports it, it ignites it. So your creativity actually produces your wealth. Okay, so that's to bear in mind. Absolutely. And also the third element in your chart, which is as equal to the wood element in your chart is earth. You have the earth element. Now the earth element in your chart is all about your influence. To you, earth means influence. And actually in the year 2021, because of the energies of the year, what it shows is that you will have 100% more influence in what you do. That means more responsibilities in what you do. So actually this will be a very good year for you to go for promotion, to go for new jobs or move up the ladder through your creativity because your voice will be heard. You have the platform. Now, as I said earlier, we have the five element theory. So I've talked about the fire, the wood and the earth and what they mean to you. The next two, the water. Water to you is about companionship, is about friends. Because if you recall, I said you're a yin water day element. That means the same element as you. So often we say that actually the water element or the same element as you is what is needed in terms of networking. For you, you are a connector. You do like connecting, but you also very much like your own space. That is what the element shows. And the next one, the last one, the fifth element is your metal element. And the metal element to you is about thinking and resources. It's about how you think about things. And actually this year in 2021, you have a lot more metal element in your chart, which means sometimes you may overthink things, which means actually, you are delving into more details this year. So what do I often advise people who have more of a resource element in a particular year? Picking up a new skill, research and resources. That's the kind of things that you should be doing this year. Is that making sense? Yeah, that's very clear. I think um, everyone's getting an idea of how the various aspects of this are actually like overlaying onto someone. Absolutely. Now, let me look at your profile by looking at the five elements. So I look at the five elements and I see how much of those five elements are equal in your chart. Because we all as human beings, we all have missing elements or less of one element. And that's what we use feng shui and astrology for, to bring balance. So in your chart, your profile shows me that because you have such a high fire, fire element, you are actually what we classify in classical um, texts as a direct wealth profile, somebody who can reach the top as a CEO or COO. And then beneath that element, you also have the fire element, which is a different polarity showing you can also be an indirect wealth person, a pioneer. So not only do you have the option to move up in a structured management company or environment, but you also have the talents to be an entrepreneur, which is quite an unusual chart, because what it actually means is sometimes you can be at conflict with yourself. Sometimes you want to be your own boss, and sometimes you might want to just be in an environment where you just move up the ladder. And this is a challenging decision for you throughout your life. Okay, um, does that resonate with you, Dean? Yeah, definitely. That That is uh, a part of my character, most definitely. Um, and I, I constantly lean towards wanting to my, be my own boss. And then I pull back by overthinking things into, oh, maybe I could thrive in structure. <laughs> so it, it, does, it does occur in my life. Yeah. So I Brilliant. think people can hopefully see that there are, I suppose, philosophical outputs from consulting these charts? Yes, there are. And so what we want to do is bring balance. So I said to you, in your chart, what we want to balance out a little bit more of is the water and the metal energy levels in you. So what do we do? We look at the feng shui of your home and we look at the sectors 
where there is more water and more metal elements in your home and we ask you to spend time there or we make certain activations there and that is how feng shui and your own natal energy chart overlap and becomes an ho a holistic approach to these applications. Right, I think you did give me the year your house was built in, which is very important. So one of the first things we need to do as feng shui practitioners, when we look at drawing up a natal chart for a home, that means drawing the energy map, map of a home, the birth chart of a home, we look at the year the home was built in. Okay, so you're going to ask me, what do you mean periods? Well, according to feng shui, there are nine periods and each period represents 20 years, a 20 year cycle. For period one, it's between 1864 to 1883. If your house was built in period two, it would be between 1884 and 1903. If your house was built in 1904, so between 1904 and 1923, it's considered period three. If your house was built between 1924 and 1943, it would fall in period four. And if your house was built between 1944 and 1963, it would be period five. We have nine periods, so I'm going to read the rest for yourselves. So if your house was built in 1964 to 1983, it's considered a period six house. And Dean, your house falls within period six between 1964 and 1983. So moving on to period seven is if your home was built or your house was built between 1984 and 2003. Period eight is if your property was built between 2004 and 2023. Now, last but not least, we have period nine which starts from the year 2024 to 2043. And then we go back into the cycle to period one. So that's nine periods and 20 years per cycle. So that's a very long time. Okay, so moving on. I think, Dean, you gave me the coordinates, the degrees of the facing of your home, the energy that is coming through the main door of your home. And I took down that degree as, let me double check, 340 degrees north. Please tell me I'm correct. You're dead on. <laughs> okay. Now, why do we use these periods and cycles? Because depending on when your house was built, the year it was built, we use to fly the stars. That means we use this year to create a natural chart because it was the birth of your home. So just like your year of birth. So why fly the stars? Sounds like a very odd term, but it's just a technique. It just means that I'm dispersing the quality or energy of the stars. So according to feng shui, since you're in a period six and you are, are facing 340 degrees north, this falls into the north one property house, which means the back of your home, the sitting of your home is south, south between 337.5 and 352.5 degrees. Okay, getting a little bit technical, never mind. Now let's look at what's actually within your home. Now, if you did, as I said, and you took out your phone, took the degrees, got your floor plan and marked all of the different directions in a pie chart, so an eight segmented pie chart, you would now be able to plot these numbers as I tell you within those sectors. So get your pen or paper out and in the north sector of your home, I want you to put these three numbers, six, six and two. And then move on to the northeast and put these three numbers, four, eight and nine. And then to the east, eight, four and four. To the southeast, nine, three and five. To the east, Five, seven, one, to the southwest, seven, five, three, 
to the west, 398. And finally, to the northwest, 217. Now, all of these numbers are simply qualities of energies in each sector of your home. Okay, so let's interpret these energies one by one because this gives you an indication of how you can use your home best to suit you and your family. Let's start with the north sector where we have the two sixes. One is called a mountain star and one is called a water star. Now, water star, mountain star, don't worry about this right now. Let's just interpret what these two numbers mean. It means gaining power. That's what it means. So if you spend a lot of time activating the front of your house with the door, opening and closing it, the very human energy coming in and out of that home means that you will slowly and gradually over time gain power. I love that. And why not? We all could do with a little bit of empowerment and real power. So then we go to the northeast sector where we have the four and eight coordinations. This is about financial success. So in this section of your home, you can really make your business calls. These are the permanent stars, by the way, of your home, not the annual ones, which I gave everybody else earlier. So these are your permanent energy chart, I should have said. But what you've got to be mindful of in the northeast is potential injury to children. So sometimes children could have mishaps over there. So it's something to be aware of. So I give both the positives and maybe the undesired effects. So it's just to be aware of because all of us in homes do have some mishaps and we just want to be aware of which sectors. Okay, moving on to the east sector of your property where we have the coordinates of eight and four. And this is about having romantic relationship. This is about, I would say, not in particularly lust, but intimacy. So why not hold your dates it? And depending on which sector of the home that house the, of the house it falls into, have your uh, fine dining over there. Now look at the southeast sector of your home, where we have the coordinates nine and three. This is in relation to the birth of intelligent children. So, for example, if this house belonged to somebody who um, had somebody expecting a child, you would spend more time in this sector of the home because you would give birth to a highly intelligent child. They may have a slightly high raised temper, but nonetheless, it will be an intelligent child. OK, let's look at the south. The south sector of your home has the coordinates of five and seven. So this is about being aware of the kind of foods you eat. So be aware of not having off foods is to do with health. The southwest sector of your home is seven and five. And this is a little bit about again about eating and making sure that there is not too many arguments happening in this part of the home. The west sector of your home has the coordinates of three and nine. Again, very similar to the nine and three, as you can see, is about giving birth to intelligent children or giving birth to an intelligent child. Now let's move on to the northwest sector of your home, which has the coordinates of two and one. The two and one coordinates represent here is about marriage and having really a lot of thoughts about your own marriage, deep thoughts about your marriage and how you want to improve things. Here you want to be aware of when you drive a car out of your home, just being aware of traffic jams and um, the kind of routes you take. So that, that's what we're talking about. So these are the energies of, of the home. I think I've covered all of the eight sections of the eight sectors in your house theme. Have you got any questions at this point? Yeah, so you've given a very detailed overview of myself. You've given a very detailed overview of our home. Do the two now merge together to create some kind of summary? They do indeed. So we take the report from your natal chart energy and we take the report from your permanent house blueprint energy and we merge them together. Correct. But why are we merging them together? There must be a goal. There must be a purpose. What is it you want to achieve from life? So when clients come to me, I often ask about clarity. Do you have clarity? What is it you want to achieve? If you can't tell me what you want, how can I help you? It's like when you go to the doctors, it's no different. Why are you there and what do you want help with? For example, you may not want power. You might be quite happy in your current status. You may not want to use the North Sector, but you may have a wife who wants to give birth to a highly intelligent child. So then I say to you, make sure she sits in the sectors where we have the South, East, Nine and Three. Other West Sectors where you have, again, the Three and Nine. Notice how they're very similar in description in terms of quality. However, there is a slight difference because when I said tea, water star and mountain star, the mountain star represents character, people and attitude. And the water star represents opportunities for finances and wealth and assets. So again, it's all dependent on what you want to achieve. If you're more interested in family life, then I focus 
um the sectors of your home where it has good energies where the mountain stars are. But if you're focused on making money, then I would ask you to do activities in relation to money in those particular sectors of your home. So it depends. Okay, so in general terms, you've had themes here. You've had wealth, you've had power, you've had childbearing, which I know is a huge thing in Chinese culture, Confucianism and so on, going back a long time. Um, and there's the whole idea of generating power through having children. It is, it is a idea where you technically would grow weaker because you're growing older eventually. But for your children, you get power as long as they're brought up well, fit in well in, in, into that. So I understand that area of Chinese culture. Absolutely, you're correct. There is that element. And feng shui is still very much culturally linked back in classical days. And this is, this is why it's very important to apply feng shui to modern day living, to millennial living, and make it real. Because there were no IT uh, or digital virtual systems back in the ancient times. So when a lot of the times people practice or apply feng shui, they didn't want a lot of the men to go away from the home. And so they would encourage the men to sit in particular sectors of the home to generate wealth, but not to leave the house. However, these days with so many online platforms, we technically don't need to leave our homes to make money. So can you see how we have to apply classical feng shui in a more modern fashion? Yeah, I think, I think it, in fact, it probably heightens it in that scenario. Absolutely. It, because, you, because you're actually depending on your home more um, yes. when you're doing all these different kinds of activities, whereas back in the day, things are way more dis dispersed in, in your geographical area. I mean, you'd be travelling farther just to get water to fetch water for instance so things like that your business would be done in a market it wouldn't be done online you wouldn't pick up the phone because i know you mentioned picking up the phone before did, did you want me to choose an area that you out of the ones you listed or is that unnecessary if you just made your point by saying that there are different areas uh, well as i said it very much depends on your goal and if you have a spouse and uh, what both your goals are now, if I was to say that um, each house has good, good positive areas and some houses have drawbacks, but all houses have really positive energies you can tap into. The existing ones are known to you, which we just discussed where they actually land. Positive aspects of this year, if I were you, would be the North East because it has really nice quality numbers for finances. And the North East this year, if you remember, Earlier on, I said the annual energy number nine is in that sector. So no, not only is it good for investments, for future investments, it's also good to boost the wealth energy. So you will be working quite a bit, but you'll be able to see the cash flow because sometimes there's a difference. You can work really hard, but you don't see the cash flow until years later. But with these star combinations, the northeast area of your home is very, very auspicious. Again, the south area of your home is also very auspicious for this year. For this year, you have some very good energies there. And for this year, again, you should be spending time there and making your business calls. Now, the permanent energy chart of your home, which is a five and seven, it does require you to be a little bit cautious if you're cooking there or if you're eating there, which means just be careful not to have off foods. But apart from that, this year, the South is a good sector for your home. Interesting, because my, my office actually sits in the uh, South, um, the Southwest of the, of the house, shall mm -hmm. we say, or the South, the south side. Uh, yeah. The landing to the up to the northwest it's because obviously there's there's overlap isn't there yeah okay i'll tell you what why don't we make this a little bit interesting now i do like activations and neutralization i mean feng shui at the end of the day is not about just knowing where to sit and place things it's also about using some special dates um, which I use the cosmos of the energies. It's a bit like astrology, knowing when to activate. So it means that the human being does the right thing at the right time in the right place. 
So there are some really amazing dates coming up, actually, which I would like to share with some of your listeners. Like especially today was one of those good dates. Today is a good day to, for example, do any kind of performance activities. For example, being on the radio show right now. I've been on your radio show. That's the kind of activity um, which is good for today. In fact, what I'm going to do is, if you don't mind, I've handwritten some of these dates uh, in my notes. Can I share them with your listeners? Is that okay? Of course you can, yeah. Right. Okay, well, some dates coming up. We have magnetism. The 12th of March between 1pm to 3pm in the afternoon. This is the power of magnetism and charm. I love that because if you have magnetism and charm, well, of course, you sell better, you have more clients, you have better relationships with your spouse, your partners, your girlfriend, your boyfriends and people at work. So between 1 and 3 p.m., what I want everyone to do is to back to the south sector of your home. This means your nose pointing north. I want you to do a quick I don't know, a five minute kind of visual meditation, if you want a little meditation within that particular area, backing south, place yourself in it and think of, for example, doing something really charming, good activities, your own meditation. I'm not going to teach you how to do that. That's something you can do because it has very special configurations on the day. Now, we are very busy people. Please don't sit there for more than 15, 20 minutes. I mean, anything with the word over is uh, not good. Don't overeat, don't overdo, that kind of thing, if you catch my drift. Another special date is the 25th of March between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. This is to do with super learning. This is about learning things very, very quickly. For example, picking up a new skill, picking up a new technique, whatever you're studying right now, if you have challenges, it's almost like an aerial and you kind of go bang, I get this straight away. I want you all to back north, that means your nose pointing south. Again, do your special little meditation, whatever it is you do. But the activity you need to do straight after has to be to do with that particular learning. Remember the human chi in feng shui. If there is no human chi, no human activity, it doesn't work. And that is the secret of feng shui. You need to do the specific activity in that specific location, which correlate and are relevant to one another. There is no point going to do this particular activity backing north, which is related, say, to business, because it doesn't correlate. It's to do with super learning. Okay, so those are those two special dates. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah, I think that's good. And, and a lot of people listening will actually be um, well-versed in meditation. So yeah, that's not an alien concept to, to a lot of people that will be listening. So that's great. Excellent. Good. Good. And please give me some feedback or May it be for yourself, Dean, uh, some feedback in a couple of months' time as how it all went for you. Yeah, definitely. If, if anyone's listening, um, pop a message in the chat or get in contact with me on Skype. Uh, yeah, just, just drop me a message on how you get on with it. You can always have a little bit of back and forth over the coming weeks and months. And so with that, I think it's time now to go into areas that you're interested in, Victoria. So... I want to move on, if, you, if you're done with the, the full readings and, and the dates, to yeah. go into either what you consider your current frontiers in Feng Shui, advanced concepts or an advanced concept that you, you would just love to talk around at the moment with people. And may, maybe there's someone out there that's familiar with Feng Shui and they'll, they'll really appreciate another practitioner talking about this area and this will be our, our final part and then at the end we can probably summarize what we've talked about because I think we've given people such a well I think we've probably blown people's minds at what Feng Shui <laughs> actually is compared to uh, someone like Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen back in the day throwing the term out when he was painting walls in purple in, in houses oh. um, for the UK listeners <laughs> if they get that reference it's yeah. probably falling on dead ears for some of our more international audience um, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, a lot of our American listeners but yeah it would be interesting to, to summarise at the end because it, there, there's so much there and as, as you've said already there's that balance I don't want people to come away thinking it's just reading stars because that's not quite right either there's this balance of energy position as well absolutely I mean um you know, a lot of people may think, oh, this sounds a little bit wacky, it's a little bit woo-woo. But look, the cosmos and astrology, that kind of modality has been around for 
centuries. That's slightly different, but it's taken into account when we practice feng shui. And feng shui calculates the actual energies of the environment using a very sophisticated Chinese low pan. But because not everybody has one or have, has access to one, we use the mobile phone. Now I say use the mobile phone because it's better than nothing. But actually with the low pan, it considers the um, magnetic north and it considers the kind of disruption from anything metallic, any electromagnets. And the compass picks up on that to get the exact accurate information. So this is actually a science dating back to 6,000 years even. It's because we had all of these sages, we had the star observers actually writing down and calculating and taking data as you do now in science as to what are the occurrences that happen in every 20 year cycle. And they would evidence that and they would write tons and tons of classical books on it. So if feng shui did not work, it simply would not be in existence today and it would not be used by so many powerhouses, so many big corporations, so many brands. So that's the reason reason why I say if you use feng shui accurately using science and using mathematical techniques then it does yield magical results. Aside from those recordings there are also recordings done of reoccurring events against every action that the emperor would take and there are entire archive keepers that every time you would make a decision they would be consulted to look at trends what were they doing on the day in the past. Absolutely correct and one of the sun strategies the emperor strategies is actually there's a famous book on it sun zun war strategies the warcraft strategies and these were all used using feng shui techniques and using astrology techniques and so there is something to it and some of these warcraft techniques are actually using modern day strategies in in the western world and in the middle east it sounds to me like it's taking into account energy electromagnetism being energy and it's also taking into account precedent and reoccurring events and, and marriaging the two together it's seeing patterns in, in both um, energy but also events hence the recording is this link between philosophy but also physics linking the two together yes because it's in it's within history that we learn our lessons and it's within history that we look at the trends and patterns and try to avoid or, or mitigate certain situations now you ask about what is one of my next advancements or passions around feng shui yeah. i love forecasting. I love forecasting using the five elements. For example, like I said, we are currently in period eight and we are soon going to be, well, officially entering the period nine in the year 2024, um, the 4th of February 2024 even. And this means that a whole new change of a 20 year cycle, new beginnings, a fresh start. This gives people another opportunity to, to restart something, it's the, the new birth, birth of an era, and not all of us get this, get, get this opportunity. So I like forecasting because I like preparation, and all leaders need to prepare, and we need to anticipate what can happen. And period nine is very much about the fire energy, something which you have a lot of in your charts, um, Dean, if I may say so. And to you, the fire energy is the wealth energy. So the fire industries will do extremely well. The fire industries are beauty, um, beauty parlors, beauty physicians, hairdressers, restaurants, metaphysics especially. Anything to do with spirituality and the highest consciousness, anybody who's in healing, anybody who's in yoga, meditation, all of these industries will see a very high demand. And especially if you are in the IT digital industry platform, again, a high demand. So that's the area I like to specialize in because when people bring me their house charts and their natal charts, we like to think, let's plan for the future. And we look at dates, which is good to make investment. We look at dates where it's perhaps good energies to get married. We look at dates to activate, for example, I don't know, investing in a home or moving house. So I think you catch my drift. Well, I really liked your point about preparing because one of the key philosophies put forward in the Tao is that an absolute they name outright is constant change. And constant change means constant opportunity to move with that change with the laws of nature and heaven as they would put it and so preparing to be able to move with that change and then doing so 
in a balanced way is very much in Taoist philosophy and seems to overlap quite clearly with with the feng shui practice mm, interesting yes indeed absolutely they underpin the same philosophies would you would you like to have any more questions from me yeah i was going to say is there any anything that is currently in the work with exploratory feng shui so obviously this was formulated in the past what's what's happening now with record keeping what are the grand masters up to now yes and this is very important collating data and the research behind the application of, of feng shui and how it works is the bread and butter of a practitioner because if something doesn't work it means you're not doing something correctly amongst the grandmasters yes they collate this data and they are all working together to put a book together uh, on all of their years and knowledge and experience, which would be fantastic. I don't know when that will be published, but so I hear that's what's happening. But in the UK Feng Shui Society, a lot of the practitioners are working together, looking at case studies and seeing how things have worked and to what degree. That's very important because we need to evidence how Feng Shui works and we need to evidence which application perhaps works best and suitable for whom. So in terms of evidence and data, yes, there is a lot going on behind the scenes in the feng shui world. And what is exciting is that we still have the modern day living feng shui magazine by Dr. Stephen Skinner. And in that magazine, we have hundreds of hundreds of publishings of articles on feng shui and, and data analysis and research. So that's something that your listeners could tap into. That's great. And is that accessible via a simple web search? Is there a... It is. Now, I'm trying to recall what the website is, but I think if you type, type in Feng Shui for Modern Living, you would see that pop up straight away. And it's a magazine and it's a digital online magazine. If someone wanted to talk to you about Feng Shui and potential consultation or to put you in contact with someone that wanted to um, reach certified Feng Shui practitioners, do you have a best way of being contacted? Yes, I do. First and foremost, I think anybody who wants to seek a Feng Shui practitioner, it's very important to really understand their credentials, know who they have been taught by, make sure that they are insured as a practitioner, that's very important. Make sure that they are with a regulated body. This is also very important because you want your feng shui practitioner to one, have all the credentials and two, that you are reassured that they, they know what they're doing. It's extremely important. Yeah, now, because the calculation being off means absolutely. that you're, you're just, you're basically moving potentially into the negative. And I don't often like to talk about the undesired effects of a, the quality of a star. I like to focus on what we have and focus on the goodness. But in reality, when calculations are miscalculated, and the feng shui practitioner asks you to maybe activate something or put a remedy or cure in a certain place, this simply won't work. And nowadays what I find with my clients is that they want fast results. They are no longer content with this evergreen feng shui where over 10 to 15 years, that's when you suddenly accumulate this wealth. People are struggling right now in the pandemic. People have lost their jobs over the past two, three years. And people want happiness now. People want their well-being and sanity now people want their children to pass their exams now they don't want to wait and i find that the more accurate your calculations the easier and faster the results the easier and more effortless you, you the way your lifestyle becomes so some of the key things which i've just mentioned um, bear in mind now i teach feng shui i teach feng shui and i do consults i'm as you know, always just before the Chinese New Year, which is in February, uh, the bookings are October, November, December, January is always fully booked. And I do work on projects on houses and bigger residents. Now, if you want to get in contact with me, by all means, please do so. My email address is info at fengshuibyvictoria.com. And I will chuck in my telephone number there. It's 07535147888. And I'm wishing everybody a very, very happy Chinese New Year because um, yesterday would have marked the last date of celebrations. And today is now really officially, we are into 
the second month of the Chinese New Year. I'm glad you actually picked up on my phrasing earlier about I don't like to dwell on the negative when referring to the way that you see and use Feng Shui. It reminds me of Zhang Zi's branch of the Tao in that one of the major pitfalls he saw in operating within the way or the path to categorize everything as good and bad because the person categorizing it is not the source of the laws of nature but in fact a human with flaws you are not perfect you are not the product of nature you are not the guiding law of nature yourself and so when you said i like to well on the positive more to me that was simply differentiating between understanding the difference between harmony and disharmony versus positive and negative which is something slightly different you're more positive you're more focusing on simply harmony oh you put that beautifully dean yes indeed that is well, it wasn't I me did. it was it was someone <laughs> several thousand years ago so <laughs> well, <that is> what <laughs> i can't take the credit <laughs> take the credit take the credit for reminding everybody and the listeners absolutely i think mindset plays an important part in everything we do every application of our lives including feng shui including astrology in anything really and you know energy in itself has to be upright and to have that upright position you need to really zoom in into the good stuff and i think that's what makes a difference in feng shui that's great thanks very much for the interview and i'm sure everyone really had an interesting time listening to this Brilliant. Thank you so much, Dean. It's, um, it's been an honour to be on your uh, chat show, be interviewed by you. And thank you so much to all the listeners out there. And I hope that you uh, took something from this. Thanks. Bye. Bye.